Greetings, tubidors. I am returned, and so shortly after the last video. Now, the reason I come back is because yesterday's video um, made quite a stir amongst one or two flat earthers, and you know Nathan Oakley amongst them, might I add. A bit more about Nathan Oakley at the end of this video. Um, the comment that I want to address. I want to address because it is just the most typical flat earther comment that it is pretty much possible to have on a video. And initially this started off as me making a response to his comment, um, but it then turned into this eight page response. So this video, is aimed at one Roberto Frongil. No apologies whatsoever if I pronounced that wrongly. I don't care enough. Um, the response that, or the comment that he put down was so long that I've actually broken it down into about five or six sections. The first one I will read for you, okay? Everything indicates that the Earth is flat, and even more, the fact that I expose. The Sun has a straight path on the spherical Earth map and a curved one on the flat one on its daily journey. If we want to verify the truth, a vertical pole at the equator at the equinox recording the shadows that occur at sunrise, noon and sunset. Sphericists are eager to refute the theory of flat Earth and have no video of the Sun's straight path, not even the municipality where the most famous sundial in the world is located, Quitsato. In case you don't know, Quetzalcoatl's in Ecuador. This does not have a video showing the phenomena. I bet this path is curved, and that's why they never made this video another proof that the Earth is flat. Oh, well, you bloody think so, do you? Well, first and foremost, I think we should uh, address this um, this sundial. But before that, I mean, you, you expect generally, genuinely, you seem to expect us now to give you some consideration in matters of planetary formation and movement, but you can't even use punctuation correctly. Um, before you claim that English isn't your first language, all European languages share the same basic rules of punctuation. The differences are very minor, so, you know, just admitting it, just omitting it almost entirely is suggestive of little to no education in the subject, okay? Now, to this business of setting a pole in the ground. The pole set into the ground at the equator will cast a shadow uh, that starts long as the sun rises, uh, shortening as the sun progresses along its trajectory, and eventually, uh, when the sun reaches its zenith at midday, when it's directly overhead, the shadow becomes unobservable. Now, as the sun passes beyond midday, the shadow will lengthen again before fading at sunset. Now, the shadow of the pole will not deviate from the zero degree meridian, from the equator, at any point during the day. Now, take into account the present hypothesis of how the sun moves in relation to a flat Earth. Okay, we've all seen this. Well, it's not even a model. It's a diagram. It's not, it's not a model in the scientific sense at all. Flat Earth, sun, moon, and they move in great circles above it, okay? So the sun must describe a great circle in order to maintain its position above the equator, as it imagined, you know, on a huge disk. Now, as it curves in its route above the zero degree meridian, that's the equator, the shadow would deviate from its alignment along that meridian, okay? As the sun rises, the shadow cast would initially form a 45 degree angle away to the south to the south of the equator and as the sun progresses the shadow would shorten and the angle would decrease before it became invisible again at solar zenith same as it would on a globe earth but then as the sun begins to move away the shadow would begin to lengthen once more in the opposite direction but it would also gradually increase its angle to the equator until once again it reached 45 degrees at sunset. Okay, Roberto Frongil, 
Think about that for a moment. Yeah? This is called a thought experiment, something that my astronomy tutor was very, very fond of. Now, if your mind is capable of picturing such a scenario and considering that this effect has never, is never, and will never be observed on this planet, the only conclusion that you can possibly and honestly come to is that the Earth is a globe. No other model fits the observations made. Okay? It also proves very nicely that the Earth is part of a heliocentric system. Okay? There is no refuting that. Point two. The compass needle always maintains horizontality with the ground, even though the angle of attraction changes in the spher spherical Earth by the latitude in which it is used. At latitude 40, and given the supposed circumference of the Earth, the compass needle should tilt towards the ground to position itself straight north or south, but it is parallel to the ground. Experimentally, this is demonstrated with a circle representing the Earth and a magnet as a diameter. But on Earth, it does not happen because it is flat. It is a very suspicious coincidence that the magnet line is parallel to the surface, as it has been shown that they are not concentric lines to the circumference. <sighs> Again, Mr. Frongel, as for your compass observations, it seems that you have, first of all, zero experience of how a compass works, and zero experience of how, magnetic, how magnetism manifests itself, okay? The needle is being acted upon by both the magnetic field of the planet and by gravity, okay? As gravity acts on every atom of the needle, pulling it towards the Earth's center of gravity, yes, gravity, it remains horizontal since there is the same amount of gravitational force acting on the north pole of the needle as on the south pole of the needle and at every bit in between. See, The needle is also reacting to the lines of magnetic force. Now what I would suggest you do is to take a bar magnet, put it on a sheet of paper and sprinkle iron filings all over it. Okay, this will give you a very nice visual demonstration of how magnetic fields appear. Um, the needle of the compass indicates the direction of magnetic flow. So, influencing the direction of the polarized needle. It does not indicate the shortest distance to the physical location of the pole. Okay, if you'd in fact, ever been anywhere near a, a grade school science class, then you would have seen this experiment demonstrated. You know, it's one of the most fundamental scientific experiments that they show very young children to introduce them to the concepts of science. Perhaps you should go and attend one of those classes. Now, point three. Official science is full of frauds such as that the tides depend on gravity when it is the heat of the sun at night, cold by day, heat, which generates a thermal wave. This phenomenon agrees with the theory that the dynamic uniformity of any system is inversely proportional to the energy of all heat sources and proportional to the uniformity of these. Great example of word salad there. Great example of word salad, most of which meant nothing uh, when applied to this actual problem, okay? This this commenter, Mr. Frongill, um, has simply applied something that sounds authoritative, yet has no relevance to the point being made, right? Now, this is very common within Flat Earth community, since it allows them to sound knowledgeable to others within the community, when in fact, neither of them have the slightest idea of what it is they're saying. It just sounds like they do. Now, what, what this commentator has done is they've lifted something from the laws of thermodynamics that sounds scientifically exciting and then applied it to their own argument without any clue as to what the initial statement is describing. Um, they're attempting to present an argument using snatched sections dealing with, um, as far as I can tell, thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so what they've most likely done is read about the net flow of matter and energy They've completely failed to understand the concept and thought, oh, uh, flows, oh, that, that wobbly stuff called water flows, this must apply. Uh, they then go on to completely embarrass themselves in the eyes of those who actually do understand the concepts involved in thermodynamics. Um, but the beauty of their actions is that other flat earthers 
won't have a clue about what any of it means. So the proponent is, you know, elevated to the priesthood. Um, that's exactly how the Catholic Church maintained control in, in this country until the Reformation, you know. Give them everything in Latin. No one will have a, a clue what's going on. Um, they'll just have to take our word for it, you know. Um, I doubt they even realised that what they're proposing um, is an axiom anyway. It's not a law. Um, but to the tides... Now, if the tides are dependent on the heating and cooling effects of the sun, explain to me, Mr. Frongel, how the tides are higher in the spring and autumn when your proposal would create higher tides in the summer due to thermal expansion and they are lower, lower tides in winter due to thermal contraction. Um, you also don't explain why the tides continue to operate at the poles during periods of extended darkness, you know, free from the heating action of the sun, often for three months at a time. And another fault with your tidal hypothesis is that if the tides rise during daylight and fall during darkness, why does the tide rise and fall twice in one day? And why don't they conform to the 24-hour cycle? You know, your theory collapses entirely at this point, whereas the action of lunar gravity upon the tides of a spherical planet... Uh, which also has its own gravity, works perfectly, even allowing tidal movement, height, etc., to be accurately predicted over the course of the year. Hmm. Right, point four. Gravity is another fraud, because the hammer that has much more mass than the feather falls into the vacuum at the same speed. The reason a hammer and a feather fall at equal velocity in a vacuum is simply because the action of atmospheric resistance has been removed. You have failed to grasp the fundamental basis of what is occurring in these experiments. Now, you want to look at it another way? Gravity is not actually acting on the feather or the hammer. It is acting on each and every individual particle that composes the whole, right? Now, the, the mass of individual particles uh, is also relevant because gravity will have a greater attractive influence on a more massive particle than on a less massive particle. And the action of gravity upon the larger particle will induce it to, well, let's say for argument's sake, to fall at a greater velocity than a less massive particle. But due to the inertia of a greater mass, both bodies are in equilibrium under the effect of the same force. But to give you some clarity concerning your original display of ignorance, all you need to know here is that in air, if you drop a hammer and a feather, the reason they drop at different rates is because the feather is subject to a great deal more atmospheric resistance. You'll also notice that when you drop something, it always falls straight down. Something to think about there, Mr. Frongel. Right. On to point five. The theory of evolution, another fraud. Looks like he's trying to cover the entire spectrum of ignorance. And as my video has nothing to do with evolution, didn't even mention it, not even once, we won't spend a great deal of time on it. But evolution is a change in the characteristics of uh, biological populations over successive generations, which allow them uh, allows that organism to adapt physically to changes within its environment. Now, I'll bet a pound to a penneth of pig poo that Mr. Frongill has never been anywhere near a class on evolutionary science, let alone read Darwin's On the Origin of Species. But guess what? I have read it. And considering that it was written almost 200 years ago, it still stands up to scrutiny today. In fact, it still forms the basis for the entire field of evolutionary biology and has on many occasions been used to formulate predictions around expected evolutionary traits, uh, which have subsequently been observed to correlate exactly with those predictions made using its principles. And uh, uh, the hypothesis of um, special evolution actually existed long before Charles Darwin, and the term Darwinism um, was applied first to the work of Erasmus Darwin, long before Charles Darwin was even born. Erasmus Darwin was his grandfather. So, did humans evolve from monkeys? No, they evolved from apes. But, if someone thinks the Earth is flat, 
How the hell can we expect them to understand the complexities of taxonomic classification? Point six. I only trust electromagnetism, the mechanics of the car, and little else. What a parallelism between the dome of the flat earth and the rainbow, surely another proof that the earth is flat. As this perfect semicircle has never been shown to be due exclusively to raindrops, the earth is flat, and precisely for this reason they do not allow tourist cruises bordering the Antarctic, since the passengers would realise that the course would not correspond to what is officially the Antarctic map. Okay, we are going to have to minutely dissect that stream of consciousness because on first impression it well actually on fifth sixth and seventh impression it didn't really make that much sense um because if you only trust electromagnetism and mechanics of cars then this is likely to be because your brain is incapable of processing more than two concepts at once so please do not try walking talking and breathing at the same time mr frongel as it's likely to induce an aneurysm in whatever vestigial organ serves for your brain. Um, so, rainbows. He's having a go. He's having a bloody go at the rainbows now. Um, rain rainbows appear due to the refraction of light through the lensing effect of water droplets. And you're right, the effect is not exclusive to raindrops. And no one ever, as far as I know, has suggested that it is. Um... When you speak about parallelisms, um, you're obviously just using words that you think sound authoritative, um, but have no relevance to anyone outside the narrow pseudoscientific realm you inhabit. Um, I, I think you were trying to convey a correlation, um, but what you've done is present a false correlation. Your argument is no different from saying, I saw a bird flying, therefore all birds can fly. Some would only ever seen or heard a crow might come to that conclusion, but those familiar with the, the ostrich, the kiwi, um, the penguin, um, the kakapo, they would know differently. You have taken what little you have been able to observe and presumed it encompasses the entire field you're trying to promote and talk about. Um, that is actually how religion works, not science. Uh, but considering your narrow understanding of meteorological phenomena and the the basics of spectral refraction um i would like to know how you would explain double or even triple linear rainbows or, or even stacked rainbows stacked rainbows also display um, a reversal of the color spectrum conforming to the laws of light refraction not planetary formation and uh, prove nothing in regards to the shape of the earth um, especially since rainbows can and often do appear as uh, vertical rods and even as entire perfect circles so there's some homework for you right there um as for the tired argument that people are not allowed near antarctica um why don't you just do a quick google search for holidays in antarctica you know thousands of ordinary people go there every year to um undertake work some of them in their chosen scientific disciplines um civilians go there to photograph you know the landscape um, especially for the uh, photographing the wildlife um i personally know three people who have been there and one of which spent eight months at a meteorological station a few miles from murdo sound um which during the summer has a population of about a thousand people um and they even brought me back a present from the gift shop at mcmurdo yep there is a gift shop for the tourists so that they can uh, buy presents send postcards to friends showing them that they had visited antarctica um my friend knows that i collect banknotes so they got these things for me lovely novelty antarctic banknotes look at them aren't they pretty very pretty indeed um but as is you know typical of all flat earthers uh, you have given absolutely no thought whatsoever to the subject on which you're trying to be authoritative. Uh, you just present the same tropes again and again, none of which have even the slightest validity. And above all, you perform no critical thinking. You're happy to make statements based entirely on faith. Um, each and every scientific hypothesis, theory and law has its origins in actual observations. And the flat earth um, model as much as there is a flat earth model consists of nothing more than baseless assertions 
uh, misunderstandings, errors, ignorance, um, and a dogmatic refusal to look facts in the face. Okay, flat earthers frequently assert that science, uh, or as they have now taken to call it, scientism is the global religion. Well, science or scientific method teaches you how to think, not what to think, it teaches you how to think, how to consider and evaluate, how to uh, deduce facts and reject error. And that's why science is constantly evolving. Um, past errors are being righted, allowing us to develop ever more accurate models that allow uh, and give ever greater understanding of the physical world. Flurfism, on the other hand, is far more like a religion. It relies on dogma and the constant reiteration of a litany despite all contradictions to their hypothesis um, that actual observations present. You know, Those who sit at the top of this hierarchy are very much like the priesthood. You know, they, they continue to present these tropes time after time without proof or validity in order to maintain the sense of worth that they've created for themselves. And just like many of those in authority, they will maintain their outward stance despite knowing that what they're selling has no value. Um, those who follow the principal players, they are like the disciples, you know, those who follow blindly supporting the, the notion on nothing more than faith and faith alone. They, they believe, well, they believe because they want to believe. It allows them to set themselves apart and to belong to a collective where they will be agreed with regardless of the facts. Um, and on the rare instances where, where flat earthers do perform experiments using something approaching a correct scientific method, they end up proving the globe and the heliocentric model. So uh, thank you, Bob Nodell and Jeronism, uh, for that one. Um Flat Earth is just not a valid proposal. Um, it, it's, if anything, it's a reaction to paranoia. It's, it's an invention of the weak-minded uh, to create a, a sense of belonging in a world within which they feel, either consciously or subconsciously, that they have nothing to offer. You know, Flat Earthers, almost to a man, or, or indeed a woman, are part of this uneducated mediocrity without something like flat earth to desperately cling to um they would just continue to wallow in their own sea of mediocrity and sense of personal failure um some of them have managed to rise through the, the mud of their own irrelevance through media like youtube um to create a following among their peers which they perpetuate in order to support their need for validation um Perhaps the most classic example of this is uh, is Mr. Nathan Oakley. He popped into the uh, he popped into the the comment thread of the video I made yesterday. Now, he's obviously someone who has gone through life being mostly ignored due to his inability to bring anything meaningful or to contribute to any situation. Uh, but he enjoys the power of authority that his ever decreasing band of followers allows him. Um, in in fact, while we're here. As I said, Mr. Oakley dropped into the comment section of the last video. Um, again, he was behaving like he has some kind of authority over everyone, uh, making demands I present him with, you know, um, independent variables, dependent variables, null points, and, and all the rest of it. So I say this to Nathan Oakley. If you're watching this, Nathan, this now will be the fifth time I have challenged you directly to a, a debate on an open forum, right? No mute buttons, neutral chair, and it will be formatted as a classic debate, right? Propositions, rebuttals, open debate, questions, closing statements. A real debate. Not one where you get to shut someone down after five minutes uh, and then vent a tirade of ad homs to someone who has just been muted. Um, debate me. And I will say this to Nathan Oakley's followers, right? If you are so confident that your little leader has the knowledge and ability to debate someone and to score a resounding win in that debate, petition him to debate me, right? Email him, text him, go through the comment section of Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever you usually send your messages to be considered by the great and powerful Oaks. Because if he refuses again, you should start asking yourselves, why won't he debate Thor? 
What is he scared of? Is he is he really as confident as he makes out, or does he actually realise the complete nonsense he spouts on a daily basis that cannot even stand up to the smallest amount of scrutiny before it crumbles? Okay? So, come on, Nathan, the ball is now in your court. Or is your philosophy just too fragile to bear any examination? Consider well and make the right choice. I'll catch you all soon. Hoi